that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about a zero support model. A zero support model. One of the things I like to do in my spare time is watch um, uh, TED Talks. Uh, I don't know who all is familiar with it, but TED stands for uh, technology, entertainment, and design. And so what these people do, uh, this company, they've put on these lectures. Uh, and it's interesting to see that these TED Talks are so frequently watched when the attention span of the average human keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. They say you have about six seconds to whether or not you can capture somebody's attention. And so these TED Talks, they bring in these people to talk about all of these different things. And uh, some people you've heard of, some people you haven't heard of. Well, in 2010, Bill Gates, uh, former chairman and, and founder of Microsoft, got on to a stage and gave one of these TED Talks. And he spoke not about being the co-founder of Microsoft, but as a philanthropist and an innovator, he made a lot of money with Microsoft, but then he took that money and started the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they have all of these charitable things they do. Can you imagine that? Yes. Wanting to do charity with your money instead of pocketing it. Yes. Yes. Wanting to help communities instead of stacking it up. I know the Bible says that a man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but Bill Gates understood that even his children's 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 children wouldn't be able to blow through all of that money. So he decided to do something with it. And on this TED talk, he talked about innovating to zero. Uh, there are times when zero is a bad number. Like if you get a zero on a test or a zero on your annual performance review. We don't want a zero balance in our bank account. We don't want a zero balance in our 401k, our retirement funds, our pension. We do not, praise God, want to be stuck in traffic going zero miles an hour. Sometimes zero is a bad thing. Sometimes though zero is a great number, like zero messages in your inbox. Zero dollars owed on your car loan. Zero balance on your student loans. Oh, oh, sorry. oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Zero on your student loan or your mortgage. Zero cancer sales detected. If you're a quarterback in the NFL, zero interceptions thrown. Zero mistakes on a quiz and zero on a whole lot of things. So sometimes zero is a positive thing. Uh, sometimes zero is an attractive number. And I think about that when I think about the job I used to work as an audiovisual engineer, uh, as a contractor for a rather popular oil and gas company. Um, they were going, I started off as an AV technician and when I got hired, uh, uh, Exxon, I, I was kind of confused when I got hired at Exxon because it seemed like Exxon had zero employees. <laughs> it seemed like everybody there was a contractor that worked for a whole bunch of different companies. And so it, 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 unless you was actually going to get the oil up out the ground, or you was on the vice president level, you probably had what I like to call a blue badge. Uh, the blue badges were the contractors, the red badges were the actual employees. But when I worked there, my job as an audiovisual technician, audiovisual service engineer, whatever they wanted to call it, depending on which contract company I was working for, uh, 
It started off under one group that they called GREF. GREF was Global Real Estate and Facilities. So the people who would be considered my coworkers at the time were, uh, you know, I did the audio visual, but I might be coworkers with an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter or a maintenance technician or something. And they decided that, well, since we're working with AV and AV is improving and technology is improving, we need to move you out of GREF and put you in what they call Emmet, which stood for Exxon Mobile IT. And so I switched from Gref to Emmett, and some of my coworkers changed. Instead of electricians and plumbers and carpenters and things of that nature, it was uh, network service engineers and desktop support uh, personnel. And, and they had this policy that they were drilling into all of us. And that policy was a zero support model. So that meant whatever you did, whatever they paid you to come in to do, you had to figure out how to make it automated. You had to figure out how to make it work without you going to touch it every five seconds. You had to figure out how to make it work on its own, and so they called that zero support model because that meant they didn't have to call you for something. Most of my job at the beginning started off with if a projector didn't turn on, call Johnny. If a microphone wasn't working, call Johnny. If, if I can't get any sound on this video I'm playing, call Johnny, and that was my job at first, but they wanted to move me out of that. Figure out how to make the projector work on its own without having to be called so more. And, and this process they called, it was a zero support model. We don't need you running into the room all the time because if you gotta run into the room, we are not working. But it also meant that eventually there would be less people there. But they wanted this zero support model because they wanted this efficiency. And I thought about the zero support model when I was looking at this text for the sermon because Paul is actually talking about a zero support model himself. Uh, the thing that he is trying to talk about zeroing out is sin. Big old $5 word we call sanctification. Uh, we, we look at salvation in different stages and, 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 and you know, we have uh, that prevenient grace, right? That grace that is covering you before you know what's going on. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. I got some Bible for that. Uh, uh, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Uh, that, that's that covering you and it's kind of like a porch to a house. Uh, we know that it's about to rain something fierce, so you would want to be under a porch if you're outside. You get some of the protection of the house, but you're not necessarily in the house. And then we have that justifying grace, that justifying or that justification. That's when you come off the porch and walk on to the inside of the house. And then we have that sanctification when we are going and working constantly towards glory. And when you are in sanctification, when you get into that house, you don't need some of the same stuff you needed, right? You don't need rain boots. You don't need an umbrella. You don't need your jacket. But just like that, when you go into the house, there are some rules you're going to have to follow. You can't go in my refrigerator without asking. There's a certain bathroom that you can use, and there's a certain bathroom you can't use. Some people get the good dishes, some people don't. There are rules that need to be followed. Some people have shoes off houses. When you come in, we can't have you tearing up this good carpet, so take your shoes off at the door. There are rules to follow. And if you don't want to follow the rules, you can get out the house. But if you want to get out the house, you got to be back out in the elements. So when it gets cold, you're not in the house. When it starts raining, you're not in the house. When it gets hot, like these 110 degree summers, you're not in the house with the central air. It's your choice. You can follow the rules and stay in the house, or you can get outside and deal with the elements, amen? amen. It's on you. Nobody is going to force you to do it. And, see, and Paul is talking about this in, the, in, in Romans, I'm sorry, the letter to the church at Rome. And I'm pretty fond of Romans. Almost as much as John, but, but not as much. Almost. It's, it's getting close in terms of what I like. Cause he, he's, by the time Paul writes this letter to the Romans, he, is, he has understood what's going on. 
he's understood what the church needs to be doing and how we as Christians need to be living. And some people call the, the Paul's letter to the Romans the equivalent of his PhD dissertation. He kind of worked it around and hammered it out when he was writing to other churches, but by the time he got to Romans, he knew what was going on. And so he talks about this sanctification and this zeroing out of sin, and he lets us know our position. Let the church say position. Ah, uh, the position in regard to the Son of uh, the, in regard to the Son of God. Our position is that we are believers, and 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 we are believers in Christ. Amen. Uh, it doesn't matter what else is going on in the world. We ought to know that we are in Christ. Kings and kingdoms will all fade away, but there is something about the name Jesus. It doesn't matter who's the mayor. It doesn't matter who's the governor. doesn't matter who's the president. As long as we are in Christ, we have something to hold on to. And we are in Christ because of a miracle. Let the church say miracle. Uh, believers receive no condemnation and are free from sin and death. Oh, why did it get quiet on that part? I think everybody missed they shout cue. Let me say it again. Believers receive no condemnation, condemnation and are free from sin and death. Do you know without Jesus, all we got is death, hell, and the grave? Do you know without Jesus, we'd all be in the smoking section of the afterlife? Do you know without Jesus, we would not have access to God? Then we are free from sin and death and the means involved. The means is that this was accomplished not by the law of Moses, but by the death of Christ. Amen. Christ's work on the cross gave us access to Jesus, or gave us access to heaven and gave us a, a, a reprieve from death, hell, and the grave. And so our position in regard to the Son of Christ, is that in the, the Son of God, is that we need to be in Christ. And we're in Christ through this miracle. And the means of that this miracle was accomplished was through Christ's work on the cross. Uh, in our position, uh, the church said position already, and now that's our position in regard to the Son of God. And our position in regard to the law of God is we are now able to fulfill the righteous requirements of God through the, through, uh, the righteous requirements of the law in and through Christ. We have been redeemed. Uh, when you redeem... You, 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 when you redeem something, you compensate for its defects. Uh, when you redeem something, you buy it back. When you redeem something, you get it back or you recover it as by paying a fee. You pay off it. You convert it. You uh, set it free. You fulfill a promise or a pledge. You make amends or atone for this redeem or, the, the, or, you, or you redeem a blunder. When, when, when someone is kidnapped and they are ransomed and somebody pays the ransom and they get it back, they've been redeemed. Uh, they've already been owned, they already are in the right place, but they're, in the, they're, they're the right person but in the wrong position. And so when you redeem them, you put them back. We are children of the king. We are God's, at the apple of God's eye. We are the righteousness of God. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and shall never be beneath. We are the lender and not the borrower. And when we are being redeemed, we are getting an opportunity to get bought back and put back in right position. We are redeemed. And I like that it says to make amends for or atone or redeem a blunder or, or, or compensate for defects. Ah. Uh, you know, I, I have small children, and, and, and my small children like to go to a particular place. Uh, it's got a mouse on the front. They serve pizza. They have video games to play. They love to play these games. And so they want these prizes. And in order to get these prizes, you go play games and you get tickets for those prizes. That ticket is not, that piece of paper, I've gone to Party City, I've gone to Staples, I've gone to all the places, you can get a thousand of them for $5.99. That little piece of paper is not worth that big old dial that you get when you turn it in, but you have to redeem the tickets. And so when you redeem the tickets, you are making up the difference. They are making up the difference between the cost of that paper and the cost of that dial that they want. And it's the same thing. Uh, the Bible says that we are but filthy rags. Uh, we were, well, since the fall of man being kicked out of the Garden of Eden and all of creation getting torn up, we are not worthy of heaven. But while 
we were yet sinners. I'm going to say it again. Christ died for our sins. Uh, we are not worth what he did for us. But he did it because he loved us. It wasn't our deeds that kept him on the cross. It was love. It wasn't our deeds or our status or our position that took him to Calvary. It was love. It wasn't anything that we had in terms of education or a house or a car or any other thing that a fade away that we think is worth something. That, that wasn't what kept him on the cross. It was love. And that wasn't what got him up again three days later. Nothing that we could have done would have earned it. If we would have tried to earn it ourselves, we would have fell short every time. And so we've been redeemed. Ah, uh, yes, and because we've been redeemed, we have a new guest. Ah, uh, who is the guest? I'm glad you asked. That guest is the Holy Spirit. That comforter that comes with us, that paraclete that one that comforts and guides us and what does he do he once strengthened and guided Christ and rose him from the dead and he now lives with us and controls us what we do uh, we know about that if we if we don't know about it I can provide some examples the Holy Spirit is that small voice that talks to you and guides you and keeps you from going the wrong way that Holy Spirit is inside you also keeping you from saying the wrong thing that's the Holy Ghost keeping you from cussing out your neighbor. That's the Holy Ghost that keeps you from fighting on your, with your co-workers. That's the Holy Ghost going out in front of you and making the things that you thought were going to be difficult be much easier. That's the Holy Ghost out in front of you guiding and protecting and strengthening you. Uh, and it says in verse in 8 and 9 that he lives in us. And it's, and it's, 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 it's in the Greek it's the dwell. And in that Greek, it's, uh, it, it not only means referring to a house or a dwelling place, but also a sense of people gathered into relationship together within, like an extended family or a community of faith. Uh-oh. There's that word again. Time and time again, I keep getting told, you can't be a Christian outside a community. Uh, it's one thing to just stay in a house. It's a whole nother thing to be in community. Two people can live in the same address and not be in community with each other. Come on, somebody. Two people can share the same mailing address and ain't spoken to each other since... Just because you are together doesn't mean you're in community. So we need to spend time building a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I can tell somebody I love them. But if I don't act like it, if I don't talk to them, if I don't spend time with them, if I don't get to know them, if I don't care about what's going on in their lives, if I don't invest my time with them, do I really love them? Uh, and it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. We ought to spend this time in prayer and study and fasting and praying 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 and praying. And praying. And praying. It's like to much prayer and supplication to let our requests be made known to God. We need to spend this time with the Spirit and that is how we will get the strength. You need that guidance. You need It takes prayer. You need that strength. It takes prayer. Prayer not only changes things, prayer changes us until the situation changes. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry, not some things, not a laundry list of things, not this thing, but not that thing, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He strengthens us and will someday raise us from the dead. This life is temporary. Man born of a woman's days are few and full of trouble. Bible promises us 70 years. If we really strong, 80. Everything past that is strength and a blessing. But Christ is for eternity. And so this spirit gives us life. It raises us from, it, will, it raised God, Jesus from the dead and will someday raise us from the dead. And then it talks about this flesh and this flesh versus the spirit. And it's a loaded term. Because it talks about not only the physical, but it talks about the carnal and the mortal and the unstable things that are the human condition. Uh, if we are going to have this zero support model, 
if we are going to be working towards zero sin, if we are going to do this, this sanctification, we are going to need the help of the Holy Spirit. That's a, to ask for zero sin is a big, big task to ask, but it's big and it's, it's not something that we can accomplish on our own. We need the help of the Holy Ghost. I say we need the help of the Holy Ghost. I say we need the help of the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I can't do it by myself. I'm going to need the help of the Holy Ghost or else I will fail. And so we have this flesh versus the spirit. And it talks about the things that we are doing mortal and the things that we are doing in the spirit. Ah, this job that I used to work on, when everything broke, called Johnny. Ah, the microphone's not working, called Johnny. We ain't got no sound in this conference room, called Johnny. I pushed a button on the touch panel and nothing came on, called Johnny. And so what I would do, since we moved from the, 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 the facilities management portion of it to the IT part of it, because the, the more advanced the equipment got, it was really just a computer. Uh, one of the funny things about a computer is that whatever something was going on, nine times out of 10, whatever was broken, I would just turn it off and turn it back on. And it'd work again. So if there was no sound in the room, oh, that's the DSP, the digital signal processor, a little small thin computer in a rack that would, would uh, control the audio. I just turn that off and turn it back on. Oh, you can't see a picture? Oh, that's the video matrix switcher. That's another little small piece or a larger piece rather in the rack. I just find that part and turn it off and turn it back on. Oh, you've lost control of the room? Well, that means the brain, the processor has frozen up and, and I just need to figure out how to turn, I get into the rack and turn that off and turn that back on. That was my job most of the time. Every now and then something really broke, like something require some computer programming skills or, or something needed to be replaced or something was, but, but nine times out of 10, just find it and turn it off and turn it back on. And so I was operating in the flesh when I first worked this job. And so I would come into these rooms and first off, I was operating in the flesh from a standpoint because we, the company that I worked for had a contract uh, terms and they said that every Problem if it was a standard room somebody would be in your room in five or if it was a standard room Somebody would be in your room in ten minutes Ten minutes or faster and if it was a VIP room somebody would would be in your room in five minutes or faster So that was all of the the the, the sixth floor There was no buildings taller than the sixth floor in the, in the, on the campus And that's where all the presidents and the vice presidents offices were in their conference rooms So if something went wrong in their room you needed to be in there in five minutes to fix it And so I would run because I had about 150 conference rooms I was responsible for. And when my little walkie-talkie went off, we need you to go to room 506. We need you to go to room 402. And I'm running and running all day because I thought that I needed to be in there those five minutes. And then I would get in there and I would find the control rack still in the flesh now. And I would pull this control rack out of the closet find whatever device it was and unplug it and then let it sit unplugged for about 30 seconds and then plug it back in. And then I push this rack back into the closet. This rack weighed anywhere from 50 to 150 pounds. And so I've run from whatever room I'm in, in the building, upstairs, downstairs, into the room, ran in, grabbed the rack, got rawr, pull it out, unplug it, plug it back up, and it's working again. Thank you for all that, and, 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 thank, and call me if you need anything else. Y'all have a nice day, and I'm back out the room. Did I mention, I forgot to mention, I didn't have a desk. So I had a backpack with a laptop, screwdrivers, a whole bunch of tools carrying it. So I'm, I lost a lot of weight working that job. <laughs> Operating in the flesh. But when I decided to learn a little bit about it and start operating in the spirit, I learned a little bit more about it. And come to find out that this five minute and this 10 minute response time was not when somebody got into the room, it was when somebody would answer the phone. 
they had a little button you could push with a question mark on it that had help under it. You push that button, they have a help desk that they could talk to. That was where the five to 10 minutes was at, not with me getting in the room. So operating in the flesh made me break a sweat. Operating in the spirit, I walked a little, I walked a little easier into the room. Furthermore, once I learned a little bit about it, I understood that the equipment was networked. And so I'd come in there and I would pull out my laptop. And instead of pulling the rack out, which was 100 pounds, and reaching back in there through this metal rack and getting my arms all scratched up to unplug it and pull it back in, I connected to the device over the network with my computer. Operating in the spirit had me typing in the IP address to that device and then I would just type R-E-B-O-O-T and press enter. Same job, less amount of work. Then I learned that I didn't even have to go into the room to do it. I didn't have to connect my laptop to it. So now when they called Johnny, I picked up the phone. Yes, what you need? Oh, what room is this in? All right, is it back up? All right, thanks. Call me if you need anything else. And once I learned how to do that, I never rushed into a room again. And the same thing applies here. Here we are trying to achieve salvation on our own. Here we are trying to make it through this life on our own. We are operating in the fresh, running here, running there, running to this family issue, running to this job issue, running to this issue in the community, running here, running there, trying to sweat it out ourselves. But if we just sit back and instead of operating in the, in the flesh, operate in the spirit, instead of running to the place, why don't we send some prayers to that place? Why don't we send some time, spend some time fasting and spending some time spiritual? Not by might, not by power, but by the spirit, says the Lord. We surely cannot save ourselves. We surely cannot work our own way to heaven. So we got to get out of the flesh and into the spirit. And it's that much better when we consult the Holy Spirit. We need to be able to put our hope in Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not touch the, trust the sweetest frame, but wholly on Jesus' name, on Christ. This solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We ought not try to be fixing these things on our own. We ought to be fixing them in the spirit. When we fix them in the spirit, it'll be easier to go to zero. The battle is not ours. The battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. But the Lord's. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear the faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. We ought not be trying to fix this by ourselves, but fix it in the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come.